Tonight on this Easter Sunday, we're going to take you to a place outside our world. It's not Mars or Venus, but it might as well be. It's a remote peninsula in northern Greece that millions believe to be the most sacred spot on Earth. It's called Mount Athos, and prayers have been offered here every day with no interruption for more than a thousand years. It was set aside by ancient emperors to be the spiritual capital of Orthodox Christianity, and has probably changed less over the centuries than any other inhabited place on the planet. The monks come here from all over and do everything they can to keep what they call the world far away. Not surprisingly, journalists are not exactly welcome. For more than two years now, we've been corresponding, negotiating, and frankly pleading for an invitation, but ran into one monastic wall after another. Then, much to our surprise and delight, a few months ago, the monk said, okay, come see who we are. This Byzantine cross marks the border between Mount Athos and the 21st century. The monks come here, as they always have, for the beauty, the tranquility, and the isolation. But most of all, for this. <laughs> Father Yakovos is one of the few Americans on the mountain. He's been here more than half his life. You have to understand the words that we're saying in today's liturgy are the same words that Christ was saying, the same words that saints from the first century, the second century, the third century, the fourth century. And nothing has changed in orthodoxy since then. It's the only branch of Christianity that can make that claim. Father Eliseos is the abbot, the top man, at Simonos Petrus, one of the 20 monasteries. It was Abbot Eliseos who invited us here and never let us forget what a rare privilege it was. It happened once in 1981. <laughs> the, last, the last time you invited a television crew here was 1981. Correct. We weren't going to invite you, but your persistence convinced us to open the door. The door he opened revealed the wonder that is Simona's Petrus, which fits like a crown on top of a rock 800 feet above the Aegean. It was built in the 14th century, and the monks will tell you it must be considered a miracle that it hasn't fallen into the sea. There are 20 monasteries on Mount Athos. Some look like medieval fortresses. Others are so large they resemble small cities. They rise from virgin forests and line the coast, shrouded in mist. There's nothing on this 130 square mile peninsula other than monasteries and monks, nothing. We expected Mount Athos to be a quiet place, but we couldn't have imagined how quiet until we were dropped off here. The silence is only broken by the occasional tapping on a chiseled piece of chestnut. It's a call to prayer, and it started being used here before there were bells. The monks here have one goal, and that is how to get closer to God. Father Serapion wanted us to understand that there is no place on earth closer to heaven than Mount Athos. Every day, a thousand divine liturgies are celebrated on the peninsula. It's unique in the world and in the Orthodox Church. Exactly what makes it unique? It's the absolute way of life of the monks. It's a Spartan way of life, but all the monks we talked to said they never want to leave, not even for a day. So they try to be self-sufficient. They grow their own fruits and vegetables, do their own tailoring, and when they get sick, there's an in-monastery doctor, Father Imaleos, who's not very busy because the monks are in excellent shape. There's remarkably little cancer, 
virtually no heart disease or Alzheimer's. They must be doing something right in addition to drinking wine at nine in the morning. They eat two meals a day. There is what they call the first meal, which lasts 10 minutes, and the second meal, which lasts 10 minutes. There's no meat and no dinner table conversation. The only sound, a monk reading from sacred texts. We were surprised by how busy the monks are. When they're not praying, they're working. Father Theodosius, born a Lutheran in Germany, is a mechanical wizard who has given the monastery continuous electricity and occasional hot water. Many Christians in the world, they are, they are looking for, for the original church, you know, for, for the ancient church. Do you think this is the closest to the original church? Yes. Hmm. When you come to Orthodoxy, you will see it, it has everything you ever sought for. Father Averkios takes care of the ancient footpaths here. He clears the trails. We went with him on what was for us an exhausting hike on the hills above the monastery. It wasn't tough for him though. He says that after decades of roaming the world, this is his path. I've been to many places. Tell me where. Uh, from Switzerland, of course, from Sweden, Finland, Spain, Portugal, Singapore, Australia, and uh, uh, Texas. Texas? How did you like Texas? I liked very much. I liked mostly the people. Now, with all the traveling you've done, how did you end up here? I was searching for a way of life. I can give all of myself to that. And I think the God of Jesus is above all the others, money, lifestyle, even family. The family at Simonas Petrus consists of 54 monks from eight countries. Father Yakovos came here 25 years ago from Winthrop, Massachusetts. This is about as beautiful as it gets. I think so. He took us on a tour of the monastery. It'd be tough enough to build a monastery on top of a rock today, but how did they do it in the 13th century? You know, that's something which even modern day architects are amazed at. When the workers came and saw the site where St. Simon, the founder of our monastery, wanted to build, they looked at him and they said, You're crazy. Are you crazy? Of course. <laughs> so being crazy was not a bad thing? No, not at all. Now, back then, how did you get stuff up here? We have mules. It takes 15 minutes to walk through the monastery into the sunlight. Enough time to find out that Father Yakovos's journey to Mount Athos started at the age of six when his father showed him a picture. It was just so impressive. And I turned around and I said to him, Dad, you know, I don't think that I'm going to be able to believe that somebody lives in that building until I step on those balconies myself. Destiny. It is a little bit. Too. From the age of six. Yes. Father Yankovos doesn't follow what's going on in Winthrop or anywhere else today. There are no newspapers, no radio, no television on Mount Athos. There are a few telephones, and Father Yankovos got a call last year. His father was dying. Prior to his death, he was asking if I would go so I could see him one last time. Reasonable request? <clears throat> From a father, I think so. My response was negative, though. You didn't go? I didn't go. I didn't go because of the fact that <clears throat> monastics do not go to funerals of their relatives or their friends. They remain here at the monastery. When your father asked you to come see him one last time and you said no, was there any feeling of I'm um, letting my father down? Not at all. I know that we're going to see each other in paradise one day. The whole idea at Mount Athos is not only to isolate oneself from the outside world, but to let go of all memories of one's past life. The purpose of your being here, as I understand it, is prayer without distraction. I'm not being distracted now. Why are, you, why are you laughing? First, tell me why you're laughing. Why am I laughing? Because St. Paul says we're to pray unceasingly. What's funny about that? That's not what's funny about it. What's funny is how you think I can stop praying. You're praying every minute of the day? Even right now when we're talking. Really? Of course. You don't see Father Yakovos praying while he's talking. 
But look at these other monks. Their lips never stop moving, not for a second. They just keep reciting the Jesus prayer day and night. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. It becomes like breathing. Some monks say they can pray when they sleep, and they get no more than three hours sleep a night. But Mount Athos gets more applicants than it can handle. It's harder to get into than Harvard. The man comes as a novice. He's free to leave if he doesn't like it. And the monks can tell him to leave if they don't like him. When a novice arrives here, can you tell whether he's going to make it or not? Can you tell whether he's going to qualify to be a monk? After a while, it becomes pretty obvious whether or not someone is cut out for it, which is why we have a trial period, which can last up to three years. I bet you know a lot sooner than three years. Certainly. Once he's accepted into the community, it's a lifetime commitment, and life never changes here, never. Every day at three in the morning, a single bell rings, informing the brothers that it's time to stop praying on their own and start praying in church. On a typical day, and every day is a typical day, the services last eight hours. The monks say it's an eight-hour conversation with God, a dress rehearsal for eternity. And remember, this doesn't only happen on Sundays, it happens every day, 365 days a year. A monk never gets a day off. This is the Divine Liturgy, the life of Christ celebrated by men whose only passion is to move closer to Christ every day. The depth of their devotion defies description. They didn't look like the same monks we had met in the gardens and the workshops. They were utterly transformed, with a concentration so profound they were immune from distraction. There were occasional flashes of ecstasy. This old monk could have risen out of a Rembrandt. <laughs> There are no musical instruments in the church, just chanting, chanting without end. Many of the voices, the basses in particular, could have made it at the Met. We didn't understand the words. We didn't really have to. This phrase we knew. Lord, have mercy. The most miraculous thing about Mount Athos, when we return.